live from Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Cube at the HP Vertica Big Data Conference 2014. Brought to you by HP. With your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live now in Boston, Massachusetts. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and sometimes go on stage like we were here at HP Vertica. Uh, I'm John Furrier with, with Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly, kicking off day two of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of uh, HP Vertica's Big Data Conference. And uh, Dave Vellante and myself were the keynote uh, stage act, if you will. The queue was on stage, technically with no desk, but with chairs. Uh, Dave, great, uh, great session. We basically did up there, did a cube uh, interaction kind of thing with crowd chat on the big screen. Essentially, they took the cube and brought it up on stage to entertain the crowd, which we did, and we informed. Yeah, I really was proud to be up there with you and, and Jeff and having crowd chat in the background. <laughs> So uh, let's talk about some of the, the things that were said and we can get into sort of recapping yesterday. I'm really concerned, John and Jeff, that of two things. One is the schism between IT and business. IT seems to think that, okay, this big data thing, it's working great, we've gotten the maximum value out of our project and business guys are saying, mm, no. Less than 20% of the business folks that we talk to say that their big data projects are paying off to full value. That's number one. Number two is there is a big shift coming the, the cost, the expense, the ROI on traditional enterprise data warehousing and analytics initiatives and business intelligence initiatives which have not lived up to their potential promise uh, compared to the potential for emerging uh, analytics projects uh, is big disparity. I think that there's a share shift that is going on now and will go on for the next 10 to 15 years and I'm concerned that this on, audience before, doesn't on, before see we, it. Before we go to Jeff Kelly on this, I know he wants his data on this. Re, yeah. re, rephrase the yeah. first one, the schism. What specifically, slow so, that down a little bit. So go in me, slow motion, please. So when you talk to people and ask them, are you doing big data projects? And what, to what degree are your big data projects paying off? A little bit, a, you know, a lot, you know, that big, or none. You know, none to a lot, that big spectrum. Uh, over half of the IT practitioners say, our big data projects are successful, we're realizing the full value, I think about 54%. Less than 20%, about 18% of the business people that you talk to, by the way, the guys who are funding it, the CMOs who are going to spend more than the CIOs, say that their projects are successful. So 54% of the IT guys say it's a success, 18% of the business guys say it's a success. Big schism. That to me says there's misalignment. The IT guys are measuring success based on, oh, the technology works, did my job. That's check not how, the box, so check yeah, the box. Yeah, check the box. That's not how IT people should be measuring success. That's certainly not how the CIO is, is measured and is going to be measured. You should measure successes. Did it increase revenue? Did it cut costs? Did it save lives? I mean, those are the measures that, that matter. You agree? I agree with that. Uh, from, I think there's a few, a few reasons for that schism we're seeing. One, as we talked about, the way you measure success is different if you're an IT person versus a business person. IT person, get the technology stand, stood up and operating, success versus a business person wants value from the data. They want insights from the data, it's driving value, whether, as you said, cutting costs, finding new sources of revenue, whatever, the, whatever that metric and, is. And I'm saying, warning, 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 that's misalignment. Right, I, I agree with you. And so that, that something has to be done to bring those two together so that IT and the people on the technology side understand the impact that their technology is having on the business side. The other issue, I think, um, is also that you know business people have to change their mindset. We talk a lot about becoming a data-driven organization. It's not as simple as you know deploying some technology and throwing up some dashboards with some data visualizations on it. Business people have to have to buy into the value, buy into uh, the hype, if you will, that data, big data analytics is going to change the way they do business, improve their business. If they don't, it doesn't matter how, how much the IT team you know, uh, screams and kicks, hey, you guys got to start changing the way you operate to take into account data. It's not going to matter. So, the so business people have to, under, have to, there's a shift that business has to have. So IT has to change as well, 
But the business people have to understand this is a new world we're living in. So basically, if you notice in that room, Dave Vellante asked a strategic question, Jeff, and he basically, I love it. Is, the analysts do this perfectly. I love how, and Dave's a master at it. Basically, how many people have Hadoop and all the hands go up? You know, majority of the hands, let's say maybe half. Yeah, okay. Practitioners, so they're all big data savvy uh, or learning about common data stores with Vertica. And then we said, how many people are paying for it? Almost every hand went down. Okay, <laughs> there were so, three hands that stayed up. I mean, I think those were plants from probably well, Hortonworks. Those are, um, those are map you know, our customers probably, right? Right? Those are either MapR customers or, or yeah. Cloudera customers. Yeah. Depending I mean, when you talk about hard works, are you paying, meaning you're not paying for the distribution? No, I said you're paying, you're paying for the distribution. The point is the hands went down. The what hands that, went down. What does that tell Nobody's you? Nobody's paying for it. Well, it, that means it's early stage POCs and figuring out where to integrate this thing. And so I didn't get the red hat for Hadoop question that I wanted to bring up, but and the reality is, Big data is a variety of use cases. We talk in marketing, they call it omni-channel marketing is the new normal for with social business. With cloud, you have different implementations, different stacks, all this stuff. You're seeing different versions of solutions that are actually really tailor-made for specific use cases at scale. That means general purpose software is gone. So I think people are really trying yes. to figure out where to go with Hadoop. How do you customize it? How do I play with it? So what's your take on that, Jeff? What did you get in the survey? Are people really still scratching their head? or is it stuck in the mud spinning its wheels? I think people are, look, when you've got a technology that's still developing as quickly as something like Hadoop is, you know, the, the application for Hadoop is changing from where it was two years ago, we talked about on stage, from you know, pure batch MapReduce style analytics to what its potential is today with things like Yarn for interactive and real time. So based on the feedback we're getting from you know, both the survey data, but also talking to practitioners on theCUBE and elsewhere, uh, we did you know, dozens of in-depth interviews as part of our, our uh, survey work. I think people are still trying to figure out exactly where Hadoop's going to fit. You, it, there's a reluctance to pay for something where you don't yet quite know what the value is going to be. Um, and increasingly, I think people understand that it's Hadoop, while important, is just one aspect of this modern data architecture. And I think, you, look, I think there is going to be a, a significant market for Hadoop, uh, for the Hadoop vendors, for Hadoop technology and services. But where the real value is going to be is further up the stack in the analytics and op, uh, ultimately the applications that you're packaging that are delivering insights and, and uh, triggering actions based on analytics. That's where a lot of the value is going to come. So, you know, it remains to be seen how much people are going to be willing to pay for what is increasingly becoming a commodity layer. Um, a very important foundational layer, but a commodity nonetheless. I still think that the IPO window for uh, public companies is going to open up in 2015, and the truth will be told whether that happens or not, and it's going to come down to, Dave, what we talked about yesterday is, will the technology be in place for people to actually deploy, practitioners to deploy these software and infrastructure to do the big data, and where is the killer app? Is it analytics? So it's kind of a red flag for me that, you know, Cloudera takes massive amounts of funding from Intel. It's kind of a red flag that you don't see the tsunami of apps hitting the table outside of analytics and visualization, which, by the way, are, in my opinion, the killer apps. So without that present, I'm skeptical right now that the IPO window may or may not be open, because if there's no value creation for the vendors that are going public and it's going to shift to the practitioners. Um, it's going to be a whole different landscape than what people are looking at. So what's your thoughts on that, Dave? Well, I wonder, so I've been thinking about this a lot. I wonder if in the boardroom of Cloudera, somebody said, hey guys, you know, we could do IPO. You know, we're almost ready to do that. We're cleaning up our act. But, but we're really not going to be ready until, so let's say mid 2015. And we're worried. Interest rates or, are, or 2016. Or 2016, we're worried. Interest rates are going to go up and that the IPO window could close. So here's an alternative. Like Mark Andreessen says, going public sucks. Why not give up 20% of the company, sell 20% of the company to, 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 to Intel and create an exit for some of our early investors and maybe some of our senior management. I don't know, John, you might know the inside baseball there. And that way we have our options open. If the market gets super frothy, we can we can go public. If the valuation no, is there, it's a fact. I've so confirmed. That to me is a I've confirmed just for the record. Fact: Investors cleared cash off the table. What about what in about some management? cases all their investment? What about is management? Gone. What about Mike Olson? That's been confirmed that uh, in, employees. I'm not going to confirm names, but I know that employees did take off the table. That would imply that management did take okay. some off the table, whether it's all or not. So there's an incentive. And now they have the flexibility if they want to go, if the market gets really frothy, the interest rates don't go up, the bull market keeps cranking, maybe they go public, but they have that option. So, so a question that came in that I didn't bring up on the stage, because it was kind of long-winded, it was really pro-Vertica, I didn't want to pimp on Vertica, because you know, they were pimping already out there, but it came in um, from a practitioner, and I, and I got an email, they wanted to remain anonymous, 
I love the anonymous stuff. <laughs> it's like, don't use my name, but ask this question. Um, and it was, it, was not, it, was not, it was not a bad question. And it was, um, Hadoop is moving into the production phase, uh, clearly from POC, and cost to oper operationalize it as a data warehouse is becoming apparent, period. Does the upfront cost of purchase Vertica versus open source worth, worth it if you get a low cost data lake and cost versus cheap? thoughts, do you agree or disagree? Well, so my take on that is, Vertica is a very specific use cases. Vertica to me is not your data, data your, one, your, your one size fits all data lake. It is for loading data fast, right? MPP, doing things that are, that are conducive to that type of architecture. So it's, you can't do that with a traditional enterprise data warehouse. You're not necessarily going to be able to do that with Hadoop at the same time. It, it's probably not going to be as cost effective to do your data lake with Vertica. So you're going to have to, Vertica complements the data lake. It's, you called it the Ferrari, I think you nailed that, John. Vertica's like the Ferrari that you put on, you know, you drive on the weekends, right? No, or, no, or you, or you, you drive you, when you need it. You drive <laughs> on the roads that are yeah. really fast. That are, and that then, are designed for Facebook that. Facebook right. needs a Ferrari. I mean, it's a high performance vehicle, basically. Yeah. In this case, a data movement vehicle. But It's not a general purpose platform. But it's a flagship. What they're doing with Haven, that's why the strategy is brilliant from an HP's part, is that they have the flagship high performance Ferrari. That's the core product. Yes. And they're going down into the product positioning, having an entry level and a mid range. It's really smart because as you saw in the room, Jeff, the practitioners are just now kicking the tires, and one question is, do people, still people think it's a big data bubble, mm -hmm. which I'm shocked. I was surprised by that as well. You know, I would say, uh, and HP is not positioning Vertica as your data lake. HDFS right. is your data lake. Right, but that's that, what the question was, I think, right? right? It was, was essentially, should I just use, you know, Hadoop, or should I use Vertica for, my, for everything, or is it too expensive? I, that's what I understood the well, question to be. Well, uh, then if, if that was the question as we understand it, then clearly that, the answer is no. You, you, HDFS is your data lake. I mean, you can decouple compute to, with storage when you're using Hadoop. So you can, I mean, you can go to a, a Hortonworks, get the distribution for free, and store as much data as you want. I and mean, basically, you're paying for the hardware. Pivotal gives away their Hadoop distribution. Same thing, and they've and they've changed their pricing structure to basically you're only paying for compute. You're not paying for storage. Like I said, nobody's going to become a trillionaire selling Hadoop distribution. Absolutely. Which is another back to your other question about you know when when's this window for IPOs? I think. It's, it's not going to be a big window because I think investors, as they start to figure out, this is not a huge opportunity here. The, the opportunity is for the practitioners. That's where the billion dollar companies are going to come from. Not necessarily, I mean look, there may be one company, maybe Hortonworks is the billion dollar company, maybe Cloudera gets there, but this is not a huge market in terms of Hadoop distribution revenue. Well, Guys, let's, let's, let's shift gears to the insights we gleaned from our, our esteemed panel uh, cube on stage. Dave, we, I think we, we hit some really interesting points in, from the crowd and the crowd chat. And I think two things that jumped out at me. This conversation that we just introduced to the industry called Born in, in Big Data yes. is a really huge deal. And what I mean by that is, is that being mobile first is great, cloud first is great, data first is which we coined in the cube a few cubes ago, but born in big data means that you are born with no baggage. You are born with you know, a gleam in your eye, you got a twinkle in your eye for creating value. You have no legacy to, to, to clutter your mind up. You are either a new cultural force, like DevOps was in the cloud, and that interesting is a cultural shift. I think that is a really important new trend that is very clear. You either see it, or you don't. And you know, there's a question that said, uh, oh, there's every tool for the job, but if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you're old school IT, and you think you're successful with big data projects, you're going to hammer that nail, and that's what you're going to look for. Whereas the business people don't see it as success with big data. So I'm seeing this culture shift with born in big data. What's your thoughts? I think you're right on. I think there's a bifurcated market out there. You're either born data driven, born in big data, and in that case, you know, you've, you've probably got much more alignment. Your IT guys and your business guys are, are, are probably much more aligned with regard to the objectives of the product, project and the success of the project. And then the other end of the spectrum is, and I think many people in this crowd surprised me when I asked, are you shifting resources? I 100% guarantee that there's going to be more spending and more spending growth going on in the new emerging big data space than there is in the traditional enterprise data warehouse space. If you ask business people, how's your enterprise data warehouse working out for you? You got self-service BI? You, do you like having to wait a week, two weeks, a month, two months for, for data? It, it, consistently business people tell you, no, you know, we use it, we rely on it, it's the best that we have, but it's, 
It's not what we envisioned. And now, the big question I still have is, will Hadoop and big data live up to that promise? Well, what do you say? People process uh, what's and your, technology. And technology. So that's, if you're born in big data, break that down. People process technology. Okay, so your, your, your people are, are, are new generate younger skill, skilled. People in process, younger, skilled in DevOps or whatever we're data calling wrangling. Them, software engineering. You know, they're, they're data hackers, yeah. right? And and they're much more aligned from a process standpoint. There's no such thing as an IT project in in companies that are yeah. that are born data driven. Yes. Yeah. Right? It's a business project like, right? with a revenue yeah. target. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's not go get the list and get right. the form filled and, out. And the technology. The guy from uh, from Saber actually, I think, nailed it. The definition. We had to. We brought in Hadoop because we, we had too much data and we had to handle it differently. That's big data. Yeah. Integrated, do integrated, integrated stack, so integrated yeah. stack, so the process is simple, there's no process. It's, you know, move fast, deploy. Process, uh, technology is stacks, Hadoop. I would add to the well, process part, and this was an interesting uh, session yesterday. Uh, while well, you guys were doing some great CUBE interviews, I was able to go to a couple of sessions, and uh, the lead data scientist from Nimble Storage had a session about really the business value of big data, and he talked about how you know, Nimble Storage has been around since I think around 2008, so they're you know, new, fairly new company, so they have the, I guess, the luxury of doing this. But they, you know, they instrumented their storage arrays and their products with the ability to create and, and uh, create lots of data. So when I say, so the process part of this is understanding beforehand, as you develop new products, that data is going to be key to developing and servicing those products. So not kind of going back and saying, okay, we're going to just slap some sensors on our products, but just one way to go about it and is important for existing products. But as you develop new products, instrumenting them in a way that they create valuable data that you can then use to both improve the product and service your clients. That's another process aspect that I think people have to wrap their heads around. Well, and I think the process is business process, right? It's, it's the, again, the alignment between business and IT. And so my argument is that the, the guy, it's like, it's like cloud first, it's like mobile first, I mean that, those are disciplines that every single company is going to be adopting. And so, I think data first is also. So big, born in big data, born in big data driven, great insight here in theCUBE. Again, another first original piece of content coming out of the, the greatness of the crowdsourcing. Second observation, Dave, you asked about the bubble, right? The question, and this is interesting. We were talking about this on the panel and prior, and, and I want to bring this up. If you look at the big data, I truly believe that looking at the data and talking to all the experts and looking at the customers, we are not in a big data bubble. There's just demand for big data action and born on big data, the kind of personnel things we talked about. So there's, re there's a rationale around big data that's, that's, that's justified. You don't see people crazy big data stuff. It's really pretty rational in markets that are growing, projects are in play, but the bubble shifting to other areas, and this is where the storage connection comes in. Storage and cloud are very bubbly because of big data, I believe. So I think the, the, the thesis here is, I want to get your thoughts, Jeff, Dave, is that if, if big data is truly real, does that justify the shift to the enterprise with cloud and storage? So, it's what I was saying, the practitioner is going to create more value than, than the vendors. Having said that, you know, what practitioner is getting a, an obvious valuation like, like Cloudera? So I want to go back to Netscape. You remember the Netscape bubble. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you remember well, because it jacked up prices in Palo Alto. That was sort of the... And Mark <laughs> Andreessen was the co-founder, who's my <laughs> Twitter buddy, right. Twitter friend. So, what happened to Netscape? Everybody thought Netscape was going to, that the, the in, the, the browser was going to be the next essential operating control point, right? And it didn't happen, and then Netscape, you know, Jim Barksdale said, oh, no problem, if Microsoft bundles, that's okay, because we're going to go up the stack, and we're going to be a software vendor, and that all died. Why did Netscape, why was there a bubble? Because people thought that Netscape was going to create a lot more value than Netscape actually did. They were looking for the next Microsoft and the next Intel. And then everybody was looking for the next Microsoft and next Intel. It turns out it merged as in the face of Google. Well, no, it was so called it was called the web, Dave. So Netscape actually had the browser, had an opportunity to create some cohesiveness and somewhat lock in spec if they wanted to mm -hmm. with the public free web. Um, but what happened was a combination of Netscape kind of getting too arrogant, which well documented certainly, and then making a move into software enterprise software and all this other you know stuff. And then three, Microsoft's monopoly chokehold with IE3 just crushed them. I mean, so, so that was just a systematic dismantling of Netscape by Microsoft and their own blunders. Right, so. And so that's well documented, but they missed it. But the web was the value. The web came in right, through I agree. the practitioners. So, he, so here's my point though, the web. But, but here's my point. There was no Microsoft, essentially, that emerged out of the web, like Google. 
right? But Google kind of came out of it as surprise. So, so the, here's the question, related to Cloudera. Somebody thinks, investors uh, think that Cloudera is going to be sort of the big next value play. Or maybe they just think... No, no, no your web analogy is actually a good one. And, and but, I think but, it but, but supports the thesis that but, Jeff... But maybe they think it's greater fool than I, Theory. You know how VCs think, hey, if long as I can make money, it doesn't matter. But so the question is, <laughs> is, is Cloudera's valuation justified? Will somebody come out of the big data world with a, with a, with a valuation such that it is justified? And will that be Cloudera or somebody else? So I, I want to answer that question. This is, this is really key. So this is what Bill Gurley from Benchmark, who was an analyst before he became a VC, uh, was very pro-bubble.com bubble. So was Mary Meeker, you know, all the people who promoted it. Um, and um, they all got egg on their face. But, and, but what Bill Gurley came back and said, if you look at all the stuff that they were promoting, actually happened. So right. selling pet the food. Hype the was, hype was, was justified. Was early, was early no, but, it was, but, it, but the market lived up to the hype. How they were allocating the value to the players was incorrect. Yes. But, but actually, actually, everything actually happened. The tooling was slower, all the automation came in, Put, moving digital to digital from paper, email, all that stuff happened. And this is where the value shifted. It shifted to the practitioners, the people putting the websites up, the software, the web, ad tech software. So that is exactly the same thing that we are saying with, with Jeff Kelly's report and what Jeff's promoting, which is the value creations of practitioners, the people using the, the technology. That's the web So analogy. your investment Now, thesis. certainly Google and others made money and they were worth billions and that was the, the vendors of the But business. I would argue they're a practitioner. Yes, I would say the same you thing. Know, Google's a practitioner, Facebook's a practitioner, Amazon is this, was, a, was a practitioner before they became a vendor. Well then, mm -hmm. so, so then the question is, is Cloudera a practitioner? And no, I would say no, they're no, not. No, definitely not. And so that, that, this makes investing really hard in big data. You have to find the companies that are going to transform and the industries that are going to be transformed mm -hmm. and make bets based on that. So that's retail, that's healthcare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, That's the things we talked about. There was a question today services. about, you know, when are we going to tackle the really big problems that impact society? And, you know, those are where enormous value is going to be uh, so, created. So I want to bring up the third point. So we're born big data, the bubble shifting, the enabling of big data rationalization to other areas um, like storage and also the practitioners. But let's talk about the practitioners. I think the HP putting up the United States Postal Service was a genius move. And I want to highlight that because I think that is representative in today's marketplace globally, in the US at least of a legacy vendor, would you agree they're legacy? I think we can <laughs> They're <agree>. slow, they're <laughs> government, but they have to compete now with privatized companies, and they have all the elements of big data, internet of things, so this he is going to be- a great presentation. This is actually a working case study of the modernization in action. So if you look at what they do, they have people process technology issues that are legacy and now trying to be born in the cloud, born in mobile. Mm -hmm. So to me, what they're doing is very interesting. They have all kinds of instrumentation issues, but that to me is a great case study, and, 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 and I think that's worth watching. Yep. Look, I think people, uh, naturally people are impatient when it comes to, especially when you've got a, a, a movement, a, a, an area of technology like big data that's got so much hype around it. People are impatient to see the success stories. Where is it? And then they're quick, just as quick to, to jump on it and say, well, it's not living up to the hype. These things take time. It's not going to happen overnight. The tooling itself is still developing. But the the impact that not just big data, but the the intersection of big data and cloud and mobile is going to have is going to be enormous. Where, the winners, though, are not going to be, in my opinion, the vendors. It's going to be so, the practitioners. Well, but so right. who, who create value, create valuable services that people will pay for, that impact their everyday lives, that help people run businesses better. That's where the value is going to be. So when, vendors will win. I'm not saying vendors won't win, but but the the investing community saw what happened with, nobody wanted to own Microsoft and Intel in 1990. When George Bush the Elder was president, you could buy Microsoft Intel at the time compact for a song. If you invested, you know, $50,000 back then, it would, you know, you'd be multimillionaire now. So nobody wanted to touch him. So when the internet came around with Netscape, everybody said, we're not going to make that mistake again. Well, guess what? They got yeah. it wrong. So, so now, vendors will make money. Now, where are they going to make money? The woman from Singapore said it. What about integration? This stuff is too hard. I'm a business person. This stuff is too hard. So developing solutions. The question is, is it going to be HP, IBM, EMC, the big whales that are going to do it? Let's and which 
startups and pure plays are going to emerge. Let's out of use that. the last minute to address that. So Bert also, has, Bert Lattimore is watching, has a question: uh, Is the Red Hat next Microsoft? How will cloud the cloud era significantly larger using the same business model, or will be bought by somebody? Basically, it brings up the M&A question. And this is the interesting thing: If you say that the practitioner will be the next Google, someone will the next Google in this new world will be a company that will be a practitioner. That has to emerge. So the question is, people, these startups are getting bought left and right, so when to sell, will they even make it? Will the big guys actually buy out the next one? So they don't want to make that same mistake twice. So the question is, entrepreneurially, are we in a marketplace that's going to be set up for? It's going to consolidate, guarantee that. Who's going to get bought first? M&A activity? MapR? My, if, I, if I were a betting man, I'd say MapR would be my first bet. Second would be Intel, finishes their acquisition of Cloudera. Hortonworks I'd probably put last on that list, mainly because a large part of their value proposition is being independent. So they go public? I would, if, if, there, if, I, if there was only one company out of those three that's going to go public and be an independent company, it's going to be Hortonworks in my Well, the, the Hortonworks thing's interesting, and I think the Red Hat by Hadoop never, is never going to happen, but I think they play that card, and I think Rob Bearden doesn't play it as much, or even at all, because it's not a comparable. Or, uh, Red Hat had other dynamics. Yeah. And so I'll just say, but what's different about Hortonworks now is that their business model still is in play, in my opinion, because of the, the critical mass goals that they want, similar to, to the old, old way. But the global marketplace is a very interesting dynamic. We brought the bubble up on stage here and we talked about China. The global market is a huge issue. So if you look at the distribution opportunity, TAM, and you factor in China and other countries, mm -hmm. Hortonworks has a run to be massively huge under their current business model. By the way, that's what I love about what Tableau's doing. Tableau is nation building, and I love that. There's this huge demand for simpler visualization out there. The global market and is very and important. And a lot of times, these, these smaller companies the, the, don't spend enough time building international because it's so hard. Yeah. And they're putting investments in there. Okay, so we have a big day coming up here, day two. Exciting, got our juices flowing really early with the keynotes, exciting. Uh, Dave, Jeff, yeah. great job. Great. Uh, for our first real cube, we did one at EMC World, it was a little bit different, more scripted, but this one was awesome. Um, HP did a good job. We got Chris Steelen coming up, we got Zynga. Uh, we got the SVP of technology at Royal Phillips. Um, autonomy, SVPs, we got, uh, um, this, the Wes Fox from Talent. Tom Davenport's coming in. He's a Babson guy, so look at the Babo thing going for me. I've got my, where I got my MBA. Um, we got Tibco, uh, uh, Les Bonnie, CEO Quilk, Larry Schwartz. Great lineup, day two here, live coverage in Boston, Massachusetts. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back after this break. Stay with us.